I pledge allegiance to. What does that really mean? Now, I have to be honest that I've been a little bit surprised at the provocativeness of this sermon series. I didn't think it was all that provocative, but you all have taught me a little bit differently. And it's been interesting. We've received dozens and dozens of responses to this series, and it's been really cool. Far and away, the bulk of the responses have been messages that have said, thank you so much for digging into this. Thank you for daring to go into a topic that we know might be a little bit controversial, certainly touchy, and people don't like to be tweaked that way. And so that was, that was the vast majority. We also had folks, though, who would say, you know, I'm a little confused by this. This is new information for me. Can you say a little bit more? And then there has been a third category that quite honestly has said, you know what, Pastor Eric, Pastor Greg, I flat out disagree with you. You guys are way off. I love them all. Thank you very much for being in touch. And the reason I love all of these comments is the ways in which they've been done. Every single person who has reached out to us, even if they've disagreed with us, has reached out in a spirit of love and understanding, a spirit that, hey, we're all followers of Jesus, trying to follow him the best way that we know how. How can we do this together? So for those of you who have been in touch, thank you very much, and thank you for your spirit. It's kind of sad to say, but the fact that we can talk with one another, even when we might disagree, is sort of a countercultural thing these days. It certainly is in our national dialogue, and sometimes it is even within our denominational dialogue. So thank you for doing that. I know that E-Town Church of the Brethren has been on a journey where we have been practicing this and learning how to do this better and better through the years, and so this has been a great example of that spirit in action. So thank you very much, everybody. And we would continue uh, to encourage you to do the same for all of our sermons and all of our ministries. So thank you very much. Whew, I need to take a breath. Said a lot there. Throughout this series, we have wanted to speak plainly into the context of a culture that often confuses and conflates loyalty to country with loyalty to God. Somehow, those things have gotten all twisted and tangled over time. We're not the only place in human history where this has been a problem. We're certainly not the only place in the world today where that can tend to be a problem. But today, I want to shift a little bit, and I want to talk about how we can, in a healthy Christian sort of way, serve God and also serve country, love God, and maybe even also love our country. And here's a hint. It has nothing to do with being in the military, which is where our minds often go, which tells us something right away. So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to start with a couple of scriptures, New Testament scriptures, that address our relationship with government. The first one, I think both of these will be familiar to you. The first one are Jesus' comments on rendering taxes to Caesar. And the second one is from the Apostle Paul and his words on being subject to our governments. So here's the first one. This comes from Mark, although it's in all of the Synoptic Gospels. It's in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I chose Mark's version for today. Then they sent to him, Jesus, some Pharisees and some Herodians, to trap him in what he said. And they came, to him, came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you're sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Jesus said to them, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Often, and rightly so, this text is used to discuss whether or not we should pay taxes, Christians, 
ought to pay taxes, especially if those taxes are going toward unchristian-like activities. In our own tradition, Church of the Brethren Anabaptist tradition, war tax resistance has been a part of our story. We are a people who have said all war is sin, so how can we give our money to supporting the government that would kill? These days, though, it's also interesting that there are Christians who resist paying taxes because they're opposed to abortion. Some even for Social Security reasons. I'm not quite sure I understand fully what that's all about. Maybe something to learn there. As they say, politics makes strange bedfellows, don't they? And there's a lot in this scripture that could be said about paying taxes, but, but I don't want to go there today because I want to cut to what I think is the heart of the matter here. I want to hone in on this message, and it, and it comes in that last sentence of Jesus. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. I think it would be fair to summarize it like this. Sure, your taxes may belong to the government, but your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, those belong to God. This was no endorsement of government, believe me. Jesus never endorsed any nation. In fact, he was a rabble-rousing renegade. He was a conscientious objector. He was a street protester. He was a constant thorn in the side of the governing powers and the church powers, for that matter. And he was so much a thorn in their side that they killed him for it. Jesus' life and ministry embodied a God-first ethic and teaching. So obviously, when asked about taxation by the governing authority of the day, Rome, Jesus calls attention to the big picture insignificance and insipidity of Caesar and earthly governments. Yes, I looked that up in the thesaurus. It was well worth it to describe that one. God should always have our full loyalty and love, our utmost fidelity and faithfulness. It's pretty simple. Well, let's fast forward to the early days of the Christian church. The Apostle Paul is addressing the church in Rome. This is a text that often gets used when talking about how we as Christians are to relate to our government. Here's what it says. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not, ter- are not a terror to conduct to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. For the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servants of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due to them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. No matter the country, this scripture is often used by pro-government Christians to urge people to get in line with what the country is saying to do. But of course, one does not have to think far too deeply to see the problems with such a basic reading. Were all of the Christians in Nazi Germany to fall in line with Hitler? Should those Christians in modern-day North Korea or Sudan blindly follow their governments? As always with Scripture, context before and after is extremely important. 
It's not a blanket statement requiring blind obedience in all circumstances. Because look at what Paul writes right after this. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And again, we are reminded that there are laws of the land, and then there are God's laws. And we know which we are to follow first and foremost. Paul points out that governments can be helpful. They can help create a sense of order, but that they are certainly not divine. And remember, this was in the context of the Roman emperor empire where the emperor himself declared himself a god. So think about that. Romans 13 is not just telling Christians that we need to pay attention to the governing authorities. Just as much, if not more so, Paul is putting the Roman, Roman government in its place. And it's a place way down here compared to where God's law is way up here. So, be subject? Yes. Be subject, but only to the point that it begins to interrupt your ability to follow Jesus. And the last thing I got to say about this scripture is, really, again, scripture with this love your neighbor stuff? I'm I'm starting to think that's important. I don't know about you. So what do we do with scriptures like this? Obviously, they were at different times, different places, different contexts. It's, it's, it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison. It's definitely an apples-to-orange comparison when we think about the imperial system of Rome compared with the democratic system, let's say, of the United States of America. When we think about what it was then for Jesus and for Paul, Jesus was not a citizen of Rome. He had no civic rights. Paul was a Roman citizen, and he had some of those protections, but neither had the relative power that we do today in this country. And then, of course, there's that whole bit that I alluded to earlier that both Jesus and Paul were executed by their government. Neither Jesus nor Paul backed any nation. Yet somehow... Over the eons, Christians have fallen prey to the temptation of doing that very thing. We've, in, we've even created theocracies. And most of the time, we've seen the horrific results that have degraded both Jesus' message and the citizens that these governments were working to govern. Okay, I'm going to take a breath, and I'm going to apologize because I told you all before that I tend to nerd out on this topic a little bit because of some of my background. Let me switch gears here, and let me tell you a story. It's an epic story. It's a story that I've been promising now for a couple of weeks. It needs to be shortened and condensed quite a bit, so, so bear with me. My opa, my grandpa Lazakowicz, as I called him, was born in Steinbrunn, Austria. He was born into a family that was originally of Croatian descent. They had immigrated to Austria some couple hundred years before that. His first language was actually Croatian. Then he spoke German as his second and public language. The original spelling of my last name, now, you know the, orig you know the current spelling of my last name, and I'm sure you can all say it just like this, is L-A-S-Z-A-K-O-V-I-T-S. Pam says that every day when she greets me in the office. The original spelling of my name was something like L-A-S-A-K-O-V-I-C, with a little funny thing over the C. 
Similar pronunciation, different spelling. Now my Oma, my grandmother, was born in the village of Švedlar, which is in modern-day Slovakia. Švedlar was a small village where most of the people were of German descent. And so at the beginning of World War II, or the events that led up to World War II, when Hitler's troops invaded Slovakia, it was done under the pretense, if you remember your world history class, it was done under the pre pretense of freeing German villages just like the one my grandmother lived in. Her family was uprooted and moved to the German homeland. <clears throat> they didn't want to go, but they were forced to go in the name of German nationalism. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, let's fast forward to the end of World War II. My grandfather's two older brothers have been killed in action, fighting for the wrong side of that war. My grandmother and her family moved back to Švedlar. They want to move back to their home in Slovakia. Not too long after they do this, though, the Russian army comes in, and they are placed in Russian prison camps. Because Russia, of course, is blaming the German-speaking Slovaks in these small villages for the initial invasion. My grandmother somehow escapes this prison camp, and she's taken in by a Catholic priest and his sister. For several years, she lives in hiding. From there, she somehow gets to a refugee camp close to the Austrian border with Slovakia and meets, guess who? My grandfather, while he was delivering supplies to the camp. Within the year, she is reunited with her family back in Germany again. My grandparents are married, and my father is born. I told you, this is epic stuff. But it wasn't over yet. They wanted something more than the bitterness and divide of a post-World War II Europe. A post-World War II Europe that had, let's say, face it, kicked them around. Their dream was the United States of America. But time was of the essence. So the way that the story is told is that my grandfather submitted immigration paperwork to the U.S., Canada, Brazil, and Australia. And he basically said, I'm going to go to the first country that lets me in. And so off to Canada, he went, leaving behind his wife, and his newly born son. Grandpa started life in Canada as a lumberjack, which is hilarious if you'd ever met my accountant-trained grandfather. The epitome of doing whatever it takes. He did that until he'd saved enough money to bring first my grandmother and then sometime before my father. They built a life in French-speaking Canada but they still pined for the U.S. And it took another decade, but eventually they settled in New England, kept growing their family, and lived mostly happily ever after. They sacrificed so much to make it to this country. And they were grateful for that. And yet, even as I tell this story, with Neil Diamond ringing in my ears, I think it's fair to also note that not everybody's descendants came of their own free will, and that the American dream has been a nightmare for many, especially those who were brought here enslaved. And we are reminded again of Paul and Jesus' wisdom, that as great as any country is, it is not divine, and that worldly governments come and they go. With all of that said, I'll also add that I love this country. I do. 
Now, again, it's a distant second to my love of God and neighbor, but I love it. I love the United States of America for the liberty and opportunity it provided for my family and millions of others. Taking them from a war-torn country, gaining freedom from where they had originally come, allowing them to contribute their culture and their skills to building up this place and making it even better. Sadly, this notion seems to be lost on the policymakers in our country today. And even though the circumstances are diff different, I also love the parallels that my, family, fa my family's history shares with my religious forerunners, my foremothers, my forefathers in, the, in Anabaptism and the Church of the Brethren. Each started, think about it, that Anabaptists were a couple hundred years before, but each started as people seeking relief from a war-torn land. Each came to a more tolerant and welcoming place. Each added their own inherent value, weaving their unique strand of who they were into the American tapestry right alongside those who they befriended, did business with, married, and loved. And now there are Lazakovitzes and brethren who are all shades of skin, who live all across this land and contribute to this country in amazing ways. I love this country because we have a say about its direction. And we will be talking about that. As the election gets closer, we will be talking about what our responsibility is as Christians and as Christian citizens in a country whenever it has an election. We've done that for all the elections in the last 12 or 16 years. So I love that we have a say in the direction of our country. I've traveled to and through enough to know that that is not always the case for everybody. We love that. And the last thing that I'm going to say for this morning is I love that we have the ability to say what we are saying right now. I love the fact that we are a religiously tolerant nation that honors the separation between church and state. Because after all, that's what brought our religious kin here. That's what protects people of faith today, no matter their faith or no faith at all. There is a lot that I love about this country. Now I know, and I hope you'll write it in the comments, I always love that, you know I do. I know that all this I love my country talk might be a little disorienting to many of you, especially if you know me because you know that I can be one of our country's greatest critics. Last week, one of the things that I criticized was the phrase used by many through the years, the phrase, my country, right or wrong. Most of you have heard this phrase over time. Of course, I can't stand it because it's the exact opposite of what Jesus and Paul were saying in those scriptures we read earlier. But you know what, you all teach me so much. Here's the deal, someone this week sent me an email and they filled me in on the rest of the story behind that quote because the only way I ever hear it, and I presume you do too, is my country right or wrong, onward we go. I learned that the original was reportedly said by a Republican senator named Carl Schurz who lived in Mississippi, this was in 1871. Listen to the full quote. My country, right or wrong, if right, to be kept right, if wrong, to be set right. Sure, I love this country, faults and all. And the way that I live that love is not blind patriotism, it's by setting it right. It's by protecting its principles of openness and liberty for everyone. It's by making sure that all of its citizens and visitors and guests are treated justly. It's by making sure that the entirety of who we are as a people is cared for regardless of station in life. 
I love my country. You know what? It's starting to sound a lot like loving my neighbor, too. But I'm curious what you think. Thank you for listening to my story today. Please give feedback in the chat. I hope that this is, the, as I mentioned before, this is the last in our series of I Pledge Allegiance To. And as we go out of this series, I hope that you will all be able to pledge, to pledge allegiance to God first. And should you feel inclined to your country, wherever it is, a very, very distant second. Peace be with you.